Good morning. Uh, we are about to begin a, a seven lesson study in the book of Mark, uh, of course, leading toward Easter. Well, uh, we'll, we'll begin with, with the eighth chapter of Mark, which uh, uh, is about halfway through the book. In the novel, uh, the Water is Wide, Pat Conroy talked about a, a teacher who was his mentor and inspiration when he was a student at Buford High School. Conroy's father was, was in the military and had a difficult time with the idea of creating a, a nurturing environment for his family. His discipline was often abusive and Pat's role model of, of fatherhood really became the teacher that helped him cultivate his writing talent at Buford. You know, I had several teachers who greatly impacted my life, and I had a youth leader in the church who was always there for me. Just recently, my granddaughter called me almost in tears the teacher who had been her confidant abruptly had resigned because the taxing responsibilities of the profession had just become too much. Often having to pick up an extra class because of a lack of substitutes or teaching more students than should be required in a classroom, having extra supervisory assignments, all of these have, have taken a toll among teachers. And we're looking at a teacher shortage now uh, across the nation. Last week, we read the Great Commission where Jesus' disciples were asked to go out and make disciples of all nations, which meant it was time to step up from learner to teacher. If disciples were to be made, Teachers had to be prepared to guide them. No teacher will have all the answers, but faith, their relationship to Christ, and their continually seeking God's will enables discipleship to grow. Many times, the best lessons are demonstrated by actions. Acts of kindness can have a, a lasting impact on the lives of people who have received them. Disciples cannot be truly made from a distance, and sometimes they may require, may require recognizing personal flaws and accepting suggestions for improvement when necessary. To get to that point of acceptance, however, the bond between the learner and the teacher has to be present. I'm going to read from Mark, the eighth chapter, verses 27 through 38. Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They told him, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples. The human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts and be killed and then after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples then sternly corrected Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up the cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, 
but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. Our key verse for today is, he asked them, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. Uh, in the, the book of Mark, which is the shortest of the gospels, it gives us a, an abbreviated depiction of the earthly life of Jesus. Chapters three through eight take place in and around the Sea of Galilee, which is in the far north of Palestine. But the second half of Mark begins with the text of this lesson and has two subdivisions, both involving Jerusalem. First, there's the journey toward Jerusalem. And then there are the events in Jerusalem, the entry into the city, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. While for Jesus, this journey was to bring salvation through his sacrifice for mankind, it was also to prepare his disciples for their missions. The learning environment setting for our lesson today occurs near Caesarea Philippi, the city built by Philip, the son of Herod the Great. It was a pagan city where most of the inhabitants were worshipers of Pan, a fertility god. You, you may have seen pictures of, of the goat's head and the horns and so forth. That was the, the fertility god that, that these people had adopted from uh, the Greeks. Perhaps the disciples had been hearing comparisons about Jesus and, and the pagan gods. And it was time to make sure that the disciples could begin to understand how Jesus would fulfill his mission. As Jesus and the disciples were passing through villages in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had probably heard the comments of the people they met. And it was time to make sure that his friends were making progress in accepting the true purpose and the true credentials of their teacher. He led the session with a question. Who do people say that I am? Of course, this question was merely a lead-in to a more in-depth probe into their degree of understanding. This first question was answered quickly. All of it, all, all it demanded was, was a simple recap of what they had heard and what others had said. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others one of the prophets. Just a simple recall answer. They were probably amused that people would think that John the Baptist had stepped up his ministry and no longer dressed in animal skins or ate grasshoppers, or that Elijah had returned to precede a Messiah, or another prophet was honoring them with his presence. Then Jesus asked a more significant question, one that would be based on firsthand experience and the understanding of his teachings. And what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter quickly answered, You are the Christ. Then Jesus made a reply that seems a bit puzzling. He told them not to tell anyone about him. Perhaps Jesus realized the danger that would befall these men if they were to emphasize his identity, especially in the environment they were presently in. 
Perhaps he knew that they were not ready to defend the idea because the reality of Jesus' purpose was still difficult for them to understand. It was time for that information to be shared with them, to give them a glimpse of the mission that the Messiah, the Christ, was actually sent to fulfill. Verse 31 begins the revelation of purpose to the disciples as the human one or the son of man explains what must unfold in the near future. He explained that he must suffer, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the legal experts and would be killed but would rise from the dead. A great deal of information that his friends were not ready to hear or accept. Peter began to scold him, wanting him perhaps to modify these extreme ideas. Then Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Perhaps we may make too much of this specific reprimand, but Jesus needed the men to understand that the idea of a military Messiah was not his role. He was a Messiah that would show the way to salvation through his sacrificial actions. When he referred to, to Peter as Satan, we must realize that, that the word Satan came from a term that could mean tempter. Peter, of course, wanted to be a protector, sparing Jesus from the, this extreme adversity. But Jesus could not allow the well-meaning efforts of his friend to stand in the way of his fulfillment of this divine purpose. This rebuke would not be the final one for Peter because sometimes his impulsive statements or actions would not have been considered thoroughly in advance. But Jesus knew that he could lead and that his loyalty, fervor, and enthusiasm would be needed to inspire these men as they went forward. But for now, there had to be a lesson in humility. The journey toward Jerusalem was going to be filled with miracles of healing, heated discussions with religious leaders, and numerous teaching sessions. For Jesus, it was a journey toward the cross and death and resurrection. For the disciples, it was a journey of growing awareness of their personal responsibilities and capabilities of building and becoming the church. In essence, their journey is a prologue to the journey of Christians through the centuries. We are asked to check our egos at the door, to accept the idea that we may make some mistakes, but that forgiveness will be there for us. We also can know that the disciples were just learning that a risen Savior had paved the way for those who are willing to follow. We must open our minds and our hearts and be willing to encourage one another as we move forward. May we pray. Dear God, please guide us as we attempt to follow you. Please forgive our doubts and uncertainties and enable us to continue to learn from your leadership. Amen.